you know, why, why is this an important issue? The fact is suicide is one of our world's greatest public health crises. It's a leading cause of death across the world, across ages. It's now become the number one cause of injury mortality in the, in the United States, surpassing um, car accidents. Every 15 minutes in this, in, in this country, somebody dies by suicide, Doctor, and, and many other places, not just this country. And it, the head of our National Institute of Mental Health calls it the under-recognized public health crisis of suicide. Now, the good news is it's our one most preventable cause of death. We actually can probably have a world where we don't have to have this cause of death anymore. In youth, under 25, it used to be that every one hour, every two <clears throat> hour and 11 minutes, somebody under 25 would die by suicide. It's now one hour and 48 minutes. It keeps, it keeps narrowing. And, and under 25 again, in 2010, suicide became the second leading cause of death, 10 to 24, surpassing homicide for the first time in the last decade. So, you know, just, just some of these statistics are, are really startling. So in 1980 to 1996, suicide doubled for African-American males that were adolescents. For African-American girls, hanging increased by 238%. In 10 to 14-year-olds, it increased 50% between 81 and 2005. So it started out as a crisis and just, just keeps, keeps growing. Um, and it, we're going to talk about this. This is just across, across the age span. So that, that, that's death by suicide. But what about the precursors that we're talking about, you know, suicide attempts, suicidal thinking? Did you know that when the CDC does studies of your average high schooler across this nation, about 10% say they've attempted suicide in the past year? These are non-depressed kids. And we know these are growth underestimates before we've had better, more comprehensive monitoring. So that, what that means is within any classroom, it's likely that you know three students, one boy and two girls, will have attempted suicide in the past year at a minimum. And it's very much related to the school violence and, of course, workplace violence that we have all been um, very much you know, focused on. You know, uh, almost 80% of shooters have well-documented suicidal ideation and, and behavior. And very often, it's actually a, a suicide in disguise. They actually talk about it as their motive. So, you know, we were talk thinking this way back at, at Columbine. You know, screen, screen, screen. It not only will help address the terrible crisis of suicide, it will also help prevent some of these tragic, tragic um, episodes. Military, you know, we read about this all the time. It surpassed combat deaths. Suicide in the National Guard literally doubled in 2010. In the U.S. Army, every single day there's been a suicide. In the VA, there are about 21 suicides per day, 1,000 attempts per month, and many connected to systems of care, which is a theme we're going we're gonna to be talking about. Well, what's been striking to me is how it's a crisis everywhere we look. Did you know that typically it's the number one cause of death among police themselves, right alongside car accidents? So in 2012, almost as many police died as suicide as were killed in the line of duty, right, right up there with the U.S. Army. So we work with police and first responders all the time, but not only as a first responder, also to screen and identify among themselves. So for example, you know, in many places, police want to be trained so they can recognize it in their partners and, and, and help avoid suicides. Corrections, number one cause of death, you know, in, in prisons and jails, it's about three times the rate of the general population. And nearly 60% of inmates who die by suicide have no clear um, have no psychiatric illness and no clear warning signs. And in rural areas, it becomes our biggest challenge. These are the highest rates. These are large populations, of course, spread out across great distances with less consistent access to any kind of care with the closest person maybe being several hours away, high rates of poverty and gun ownership. And with all this, this kind of bad news, we actually, I think, have a, have a hopeful campaign. It has, if you take suicide worldwide, they've outnumbered deaths from war, natural disaster, and murder combined. And 
you know, the, the World Health Organization estimates in a few years depression will be the second most debilitating disease in the world, second only to heart disease. And again, it, it, this is not just because of the tragic loss of life and human suffering. The, the economic cost is, is great. And throughout the developed world, we know that self-harm now is the leading cause of death from 1549, surpassing cancers, heart disease, and you know, in high-income countries, it trails only breast cancer as the killer of women in their early 40s, and has become the leading killer of women in their in their crisis. Has a very significant public health burden attached to it. So, a billion dollars a year in medical and work loss damages across the world. Um, in the U.S., this was many years ago, five billion a year. I think it's something like 12 now. But this next statistic just startles me every time I, I think about it. If you take a large corporation of about 100,000 employees, every seven days, every seven days, an employee or a family member will die by suicide. And every single day, there will be three suicide attempts, resulting in you know, significant medical injury and disability, which of course directly impacts healthcare costs, particularly for self-insured companies. So the other thing that's related to this is that depression is the number one cause of work-related absence in, in, in business in general. So you know, when you're screening in businesses, you're not only taking care of your employees, you're also helping your bottom dollar very, very dramatically. You know, in some states that we work with, there were more suicides in the employee assistance program than in the inpatient psychiatric hospitals. And you can see, you know, according to the to the Center for Disease Control, you know, we would say 1.2 million dollars for every every suicide we pre we prevent. We also know that 90 percent of people who die by Suicide have an untreated mental illness, 60% of which is depression. So I actually had the great fortune to give a speech to the leaders of the European Union on how to fight depression and suicide. And I said, you can put up barriers on bridges and do all these other things, but if you want to maximize impact, it's about treatment and identification. Unfortunately, most people who treatment don't get it. 50 to 75% of those in get prevention absolutely depends upon appropriate of medicine. And even of psychiatry has been challenged by a lack of clarity as to what to call things. And corresponding to that, we've had no well-defined terminology. So what ends up happening is the same exact occurrence is called 16 different things. So you have no precision of communication. And this clearly is going to have negative implications on how we manage. If we can't properly identify, we certainly can't understand, manage, or treat no matter where we're trying to do so. Now, you guys know all the controversies with whether medications cause people to be suicidal. As was mentioned, I was the person that led the team that was commissioned by the FDA to make sense of that. So this problem that I'm describing has had profound impact on our safety regulatory questions. And actually, they ask for this scale now across most areas of medicine. But it, but it, of course, limits our confidence also in epidemiological statistics, right? Because if everybody's defining things differently, how can we compare across counties, cities, states, countries? Now, the good news is the CDC has adopted this now, so we're, we're making progress. But this problem has, it, has had its tentacles in lots of different places. This is a quote from the Institute of Medicine highlighting this very problem as one of our major impediments to suicide prevention efforts 
in general. We also know that we're going to see suicidal issues across every medical disorder and well beyond into the general population, as I indicated. If you take any medical illness, 25% will have a suicidal thought, almost 9% will have made an attempt. This is one study in cancer patients, almost 18% independent of depression. So no matter where we're looking, this is an issue and we know that we need to get it right. And that's actually how we, how we get to this, this scale. You know, people assume because the FDA asks for it that we created it for them, but it actually happened many years before that. We were running the first national study of treatment of suicide attempters in adolescents. Even though it's the second or leading, third leading cause of death in that age group, there had never been a large intervention trial to look at how to help them. So in this important national study, we had every scale for suicide and depression, and the experts said, there's nothing to do this. There's nothing to put ideation and behavior together or look at severity. So we created it to fill this gaping hole in the field that had never been filled before. It's evidence-based and supported, and it's very low burden. When you do what I call the whole thing, because there's a screening version too, it takes just a few minutes. And what we think it does is get you the most uh, critical information you'd want to track in any setting. You know, we got together as authors and said, what's the minimal amount of information we'd want to track, whether it's um, an office, a medical ED, an army base, or a school? And I would say that this is my favorite slide because it's very hopeful. This, this shows where it's being used across the world or requested to be used. So, you know, Health Canada, um, Japanese National Institute, tribal nations, fire departments, police departments, primary care, um, prisons, homeless, clergy, crisis negotiation. You basically name it, and they've started to come to us. And, that, and it, it, it started to come to us in a very bottom-up way for a very long time. And we work with many states and countries and, and you know, one of the first top-down states um, made this very important point about the linking of systems. When you're doing the same thing, workplace, inpatient bridge, outpatient community, you're going to quicken care to the people who need it. You know, Tennessee said it's so important that the, the school nurse is going to be doing the same thing as the EMT, as, as the hospital. In New York, New York is one of those those states, and we just got off the phone with with New York. And in terms of their their ACT programs, which are these you know outpatient um, treatment teams, they were talking about what a huge difference it's made in terms of the communication and the linking of systems and making care and and suicide prevention so much more more efficient. And we you know we we work with the U.S. Department of Education. We had the great fortune to to consult with them a few times, and it can be used across across every type of education, from preschool through higher education, and and all types of gatekeepers, as you're going to hear. And this is this is what has happened in the military, which is very exciting. You know, I you'll see we're up to about 11 states, and I used to say New York's going top down, but what about New Jersey? And now we're at about 11 states, and it, it really relies on people finding out about it. And it was the same thing with the military, three National Guards, how do we get the rest to know about it? So that bottom up really reflects its feasibility and a great need. But as you all know, probably top down is where you get the most profound change. So that's why this is particularly exciting. So the US Army is building it into their behavioral health data platform, the National Guard, the Air Force, the Navy, Marines, total force rollout. And this, this is important. This is how the Marines are doing it. And this just reflects the scope of people and gatekeepers that can do it in any workplace, any organization, and it's a great model. So the Marines, their total force rollout, they have gone or going to all 16 installations, including Okinawa, and training all support workers, family advocacy, victims advocates, attorneys, chaplains. So every time an attorney meets with a, a Marine, they do the scale because it's a vulnerable time. In, in, in fact, um, legal issues have now surpassed everything else in terms of the number one precipitant for Marine suicide. So, Again, this really illustrates the kind of scope of impact and, and use. And this is 
you know, I'm going to talk a lot about saving money and redirecting resources while uniquely identifying. And this is what we're hearing no matter where you go. So, for example, this is a quote from somebody in a military setting. Valuable tool to ensure that necessary steps were taken to safeguard an individual or return them back home with support. It can help avoid unnecessary hospitalization or save a life. And th those are the kind of counterparts that is the, is the theme that I'm going to be going to be talking about. And what this scale has really shown for the first time is the ability, according to many people, the ability to predict. And this is um, an NIMH quote saying, you know, to be able to determine clinically meaningful points at which a person may be at risk is something that is so important and that, that other, other uh, methods have not been able to do. And as I said, New York State is one of those top-down states. And why is it making a difference? They feel that it separates the wheat from the chaff. It focuses attention where it needs to be. So in terms of how it can be helpful to your state, to your system, to your workplace, this is kind of some of the details. So you can see suicide screening tools to be rolled out in Rhode Island. This will be transformative for Rhode Island because it will improve care and allow us to focus resources where they most help people. Easy way to save lives by tying it to our electronic health records, it becomes that much more streamlined into everyday care. That goes back to the linking of systems again. And this is Georgia. This was one of the first big top-down states. Um, and what was so interesting, so you see this plan from crisis lines to homeless. But what was amazing with Georgia is that the crisis lines actually came to us first. And people were literally going up to Georgia leadership and saying, you are going to require this, aren't you? When, when do you have something where people are asking for it to be mandated? And again, I just think that reflects the great need and the usefulness. Somebody else said, oh, I get it. This is more than just filling out two other pieces of paper. This is actually going to help people. And this is what Georgia is doing. And again, this is a great model for any kind of system, school, or workplace. Provider by provider, all services, between services, and in systems of care. You can see assessment, intervention, quality management. And it's not just the SSRS, by the way. They also do something called safety planning, which is a brief crisis contact first time intervention. And that's the same thing that New York is doing. So this kind of systems approach. You know, New York State did an assessment of all of their recent suicides. And every one looked exactly the same. No good risk assessment, no safety plan, and no warm handoff. And that's what these systems approaches are, are trying to address. So each state is kind of different. In New Jersey, the original plan was all service, all schools and all services that touch youth and young adults, juvenile justice, et cetera. But the adult side is doing it as well. Tennessee, it's the Department of Mental Health. It's the crisis assessment tool for Tennessee, all hospitals, all schools. And the new states are kind of can do it in all these ways. Rhode Island has a statewide report for all first responders, but again, there's no reason why all the new states can't just do it in all of these different ways or systems. So in Maine, it's part of the it will be part of the statewide health improvement plan and primary care. And this is a county in Michigan, and when they say top down, this is what they mean: bus drivers, cafeteria workers, road patrol. And this is really important because when you have whole geographical locations or settings where there are no holes, that will go a tremendous way towards prevention. And when I said at the beginning that rural areas are our worst, our greatest challenge, but we have a hopeful response. So this kind of blanket coverage becomes really critical. So this is a quote that I think sums some of it up very nicely. Ultimately, it serves as an effective mobile crisis tool which gets to the right people at the right time and right place and helps to save lives and save public dollars. And you know, this was the Tennessee in which was, you know, I, I thought hopeful. Hope at last to break suicide silence. But what I found so interesting was reading the blog on the newspaper's website, a leading cause of death, I have my doubts, maybe in some third world oppressed countries or among some teenagers, but certainly not in the US. Hope at last to break suicide silence. I was not aware there was any. And this was from a retired mental health editor, of all people. So I always say that even if we weren't identifying better, which we are, I believe, the fact that we're having this conversation is of critical importance. So that's a lot about what 
its impact is and meaning, and we'll, of course, talk more about that. But you know, what is it? It's simply a 1 to 5 rating for suicidal thoughts of increasing severity. It's always as little as these two screen questions for suicidal thoughts. So somebody gets asked, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? The behavior section fixes the problems that we've seen in the past. Most, most, most importantly, it covers the full range of behaviors for the first time. You know, it used to be that traditionally we would just ask about a suicide attempt, and then you miss the person that bought the gun yesterday, or put the noose around their neck and changed their mind, or wrote the suicide note things we absolutely cannot afford to miss. And it's the first thing with definitions. You remember that comment from IOM about the importance of definitions. And standardized questions for each category to guide the easiest and most improved identification. So the way it happens is this is that one through five of increasing severity. So only and only if, really, really only if, if somebody says yes to that second question I just that they told you, have you actually had thoughts of killing yourself? Then they go on to get asked, have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? You can't have a method, intent, or plan an intent if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. Those are subcategories of it. So the questions that we need to get at, you know, that we need for to determine if somebody's at high risk only get asked you know, when, when, when they should be asked. Now, every single thing on this scale is there because it's, it needs to be assessed. If you just take one behavior we, we are talking about here, what we call a preparatory behavior, that's buying a gun, collecting pills, writing a will or suicide note, just that one behavior, somebody's eight to 10 times more likely to end their life, to die by suicide. Now, the good news is these worrisome answers, so we're able to get at high-risk people for the first time, people say, in a, in a much more precise way. And the good news is these high-risk people, these worrisome answers are very rare. This is a phone system um, delivery that I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. So the way it works is somebody picks up the phone, and they get asked the questions electronically with a human voice, and they press the buttons for the answers. And it's connected to two call centers, and there's immediate transfer of information to whomever needs it. And if there's a worrisome answer, the bells and whistles don't go off until there's acknowledgment of receipt. So look at, with 50,000 administrations, we're now up to 100,000 with this, with this methodology, with 50,000, less than 1% were worrisome answers. So they're very rare. But within that 1%, only 13% of those answers were actual suicide attempts. And all the rest, almost 500 of them, were these other behaviors that we were never asking about before. So this really illustrates to me why we're moving towards better prevention. We also have scientific support now showing that each one of these behaviors in the full range is equally predictive to a suicide attempt in terms of showing us who's going who's gonna to go on to make a short-term suicide attempt. And this is the same kind of information out of a, a VA system in Detroit. So very high-risk population, right, vets? They did a, a pilot with almost 3,000 vets who were going to see their psychiatrist, the more high-risk people. Only 14 out of 3,000 screened positive and only four or five of them needed acute care. So we're always talking about how this is reducing unnecessary things and really getting us to these much rarer high-risk people. And this is another great example of, of how it, it's beneficial to a system in terms of uniquely identifying and, and kind of reducing a lot of the, the noise. So related to that, people assume that when you start to ask these questions across primary care, across a workplace, across a school, you're going to increase burden, understandably. But actually, the data points in, in the opposite direction. So there's, there's one particular scale that gets used all the time across the world, which has one question for, for, for suicidal issues. Have you had thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way? This was developed in, in, in primary care. And this is data out of 
Cleveland Clinic. So Cleveland Clinic went policy with the CSSRS a long time ago. And look at, look at these numbers. They got almost 24% positive screens according to that one question that people standardly use in, in uh, primary care versus 6.2% on the CSSRS with a few additional questions while, while they uniquely identified cases that would have been missed. So it's a great example of the win-win nature of doing it, dramatic reduction of false positives while uniquely identifying. And similarly, these are obesity patients. When they just relied on triggered responses, you know, not systematic asking the questions, they got 452 occurrences. When they moved to systematically using the CSSRS across everybody, they got 12. A dramatic example of reduced burden. Now, I've alluded to this a few times, but I would say that one of the greatest um, contributions of this scale is its impact on care delivery and service utilization. And the way that it does that is it has operationalized criteria for next steps, whatever those next steps are specific parameters for triggering a referral to a mental health professional, for putting on one-to-one, -one, for, you know, whatever it may be. And what that's doing is leading to a tremendous amount of decrease of unnecessary interventions. Because in the past, people didn't know what to manage. So they would hear any answer and they would walk to an ER or send home from a workplace or put on one-to-one -one or hospitalize. And this is an example of how it's triaging and streamlining. So New York State, as I said, is one of those top-down states. This is the electronic medical record from New York State. And it's not just the CSSRS that's built into it. It's those high-risk answers. So if you get one of those rare high-risk answers that we were talking about, the big red suicide alert arrows go off. And that travels with the person as they go through their, their history. This is another example. This is the largest provider of behavioral health care in the United States, something called Centerstone. When you get these worrisome answers is when they have their highest level of alert and monitoring. This is a, a hospital system. When you get these answers, that's when you get the one-on-one -on -one psychiatric consults. And then they have a version where the triage points for the nurse or the school are right there on the form to know what the next steps are. And this is an army base. Always the same formula, just dependent on what the system is. So if they get the worst answer, which we call 4 or 5, emergent action necessary, behavioral health consultation. And then it decreases as you decrease in the severity of, of the answer. And this is amended for whatever system it is, a primary care office, again, a, you know, a workplace or a school. And this is a, it's a research supported um, threshold. And what that means is these particular high risk answers have been shown to really um, significantly, more significantly predict who was going to go on to make a suicide attempt. And this, this is really compelling. You know, in, the, in this, when the, that phone system, they had 35,000 non-suicidal depressed adults. When they had these certain ideation answers, you remember when we went through the questions and it said, do you have intent to act or do you have a plan and intent? Those are those high risk answers, what we call a four or five. If they had one of those, they were significantly more likely to go on to make an attempt. If they had that and a behavior, they were nine times more likely to make an attempt. So great, great, very meaningful prediction. And the, and the ability to predict, again, ultimately helps us do all these things. Those thresholds help us reduce a lot of unnecessary um, burden and unnecessary work while uniquely identifying high-risk people. So this is one of the most important slides that I can show you. You know how I said it, it's leading to a lot of reduction of unnecessary intervention. So this is the first system, large hospital system, that used it. And you see those bars on the right? Those are their suicide watch or their one-to-ones. So their one-to-ones declined steadily over the next quarters without anything tragic happening. So, you know, people often say saving lives and saving money. But I always add that this is not just about saving money. This is also about getting care to the people who need it. You know, one, one system said we had 20 suicide watches indicated, 
but we didn't have 20 people to to watch them. So before we had this scale, it was like playing it was like playing Russian roulette. If everybody's on high alert, then then nobody is. And this is um, a year more follow up on this system. So you see the red line is where their suicide watches or their one to ones were prior to the CSSRS. So they always stayed below that. But one month, the economy got much worse. Unemployment went up. And you see your first spike in identification. A year later, same thing. So what that tells us, we think, is that um, the scale is doing what it needs to be doing, picking up people when they, when they need to be picked up, which is what we need to do everywhere we're looking. And this is a quote from that hospital system. It allowed us to identify those at risk and better direct limited resources in terms of psychiatric consultation services and patient monitoring, and has also given us the unexpected benefit of identification of mental illness in the general hospital population, which allows us to better serve our patients and our community. And it doesn't matter, again, where we're looking. Corrections, California has one of the largest prisons, and they said that they spent $20 million in one year in these suicide, on these suicide watches that they think will be halved. And they have countless, countless systems that come to us with the same, the same dilemma. And it's reached a, a policy level. So Rhode Island, um, as I alluded to, had a Senate commission hearing on ER overuse. And the state senators talked about the scale as the means to reducing ER overuse because the first responders use it. So this is Rhode Island's statewide report. Statewide coordination and implementation, this recommendation would be critical in assisting those in the field with an additional tool for everyday use. And it's a quote from the, from the Rhode Island police officer about how meaningful it is. And then schools. You know, there's a tremendous amount of controversy across this nation about ER overuse by schools. New York City did a four hospital study and they found that 61 to 97 percent of their referrals did not require hospitalization. This is a quote from the Department of Education. The great majority of kids and teens referred by schools for psych ER eval are not hospitalized and do not require the level of containment cost and care entailed in the ER eval. And evaluation in hospital-based psych ERs is costly, traumatic to kids and families, and less effective probably in getting them where they need to go. So Cranes wrote their second article on the CSSRS, and they talked about our pilot project with 38 middle schools training the nurses. This was presented to the city council. They found 100 kids that would have been missed while reducing the noise. And yet, you know, in, in Tennessee, two weeks after training the school system for that state, I got a, my first email, you know, probably already saved a life while the other stuff is reduced. So the, the kid who sat in the principal's office for nine hours waiting for the EMT to get there that never needed to be sitting there in the first place. And, and again, we all want to save lives, but having secondary gain helps us do just that, whether it's saving money or protecting us against liability. So Cranes, in their first article, they consulted with a malpractice attorney who said that asking these questions also provides legal protection. And we hear from countless, countless uh, risk managers and insurance companies that, that use it for that, for that, one, that being one of the reasons. And remember I said the CDC has adopted it. So you can see a link to the scale in the new CDC document, which is really great. You know, linking of systems and common language is terrific. But this is also in the CDC document, the unacceptable terms, the terms that shouldn't be used anymore. And what this is doing us, we, what this is doing, we think, it, is moving us towards a more meaningful common language. It can be used across the age span, all special populations. It's been given millions of times across the world, across ages, with very good feasibility, very good acceptance in practice, and patient satisfaction. And you don't need to be a mental health professional to administer it. So 812 nurses were trained at one system, and they got 99% reliability even independent of education, because there were a whole bunch of high school degrees in there. So that means all types of gatekeepers can do it, as I, as I again alluded to before. And you know, I like to tell this story about the gatekeepers, because I think it's, I think it's really illustrative. So I, I went to train a Hindu temple 
in Schenectady, New York, very disadvantaged population, very high suicide rate. I trained the priests and the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the high school kids. And two weeks later, there was an article in the newspaper. This grandmother who was at the training, her grandson walked in. He didn't look very good. She asked the questions, and it said probably saved his life. The closer we can get to everybody everywhere all the time, and this can be done in a self-report way, which you'll see, you know, the the more the closer we're going to get to doing away with all that this costs us in addition to in addition to, to lives. And it's very important. It's as important as having the right questions, having innovative delivery. We need to be able to have feasible delivery. So examples of this are laminated cards, metal keychains, apps on phones, portable printers, and EMT vehicles. Again, because we need to have efficient delivery of the right questions. And this is another one of those. This is that phone system that I was talking about. And I, I do think this is an optimal, a critical piece of an optimal prevention plan. So again, somebody picks up the phone, they get asked the questions electronically with a human voice, it's a self-report, they press the buttons for the answers, there's immediate transfer of information to whomever needs it, and if there's a worrisome answers, they don't stop until somebody acknowledges receipt. Now, think about, think about this. this. This is like pilots and surgeons with their checklist. You never get a question missed, and that increases, that ultimately save lives, saves lives. And you know, most of you, many of you probably know that when somebody's discharged from a hospital, it's a time of great risk. We haven't really known how to monitor them very well. So imagine, somebody can actually call in from their bed one week post-discharge, two weeks post-discharge, and we have a way to monitor that we've never been able to do before. In New Jersey, they talk about the summer as being increased, a time of increased risk for kids. And you know, a kid you know, drinking, taking drugs, they don't get to see them. So imagine somebody can call in, a kid can call in from their cell phone, gives us a way to monitor. In a, wor in a workplace, somebody could sit at their desk you know, and do it on the computer or pick up the phone and do it. They can call in from at home when they're absent, when they're not absent. I mean, this is a tremendous, tremendously indicated and useful approach, particularly in these kind of settings like, like workplaces. And this is another example of innovative delivery. So this is a poster that a, a National Guard did. Have you or someone you know? And it gives the questions. Um, and that can be in a school, in a primary care office. Again, the more we kind of paper and plaster in many different ways, the better off um, you know, we're going to be. And, and one of my final points is that you know, it, it also is tailored for population-specific uh, questions. So this is a pediatric version. Um, which adds a few additional ways to ask the questions for very young kids. You know, it says, have you thought about how to make yourself not alive anymore? You know, six-year-olds don't typically write, write wills. This was um, a suicide cluster in, in Schenectady in New York again, and it was a different demographic. It was gang, a gang-related precipitate, and it, it was, um, you know, these girls were trying to, to get out of, of gangs, and they couldn't, so instead they were, they were they were taking their lives. So when I said a different demographic, it was African American females, and it was this gang-related precipitant. So in this case, we trained the police and the schools, and the state wanted to know if it was, you know, related. The subsequent issues we were assessing were related to that. So we found a way to do that. And this is what we do in the military. They do the same ideation and behavior that a workplace would do, but they add a few additional questions. So, for example, financial troubles. You see, it says. Sometimes a person can feel that others close to them, e.g. family, would be better off financially if the person were no longer alive. Have you experienced this? Because people are taking their lives because of the in the Army, for example, because of the financial meaning it has. There are prison examples. You know, when somebody misses a visit or a lawyer visit, it's a time of risk. So this can be, you know, things can be added for any particular setting or population. And, you know, I, 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 I want to say this as much as I can everywhere. You know, almost 50% of suicides see their primary care doctor the month before they die. We should be asking these questions the way we monitor for blood pressure. And we know that it will work. And this is a, you know, a, the Action Alliance, National Action Alliance saying that we must do screening. It's one of the things we need to do to start, to start, um, preventing or to continue trying to increase prevention. And we know that it works. 
you know, an author on the scale, Dr. Mann, has a seminal article in JAMA showing that screening results in lower suicide rates in adults. This is American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, this college project, screening project. One suicide in four years post-screening versus three suicides in four years pre-screening. But I would bet my bottom dollar we'd see it everywhere we looked. And you know, college presidents are so worried, understandably, about the liability of suicide. Well, a history of a suicide attempt is the number one risk factor. Ask a few questions when they come in for their health screens. It will go a tremendous way towards towards prevention. And we also know that monitoring is critical. We need to be doing this all the time at every visit, like like you know, like we do blood pressure. God forbid the time the time you didn't ask is the time you needed to ask. And when you think about it, it's just a few questions. So it ultimately is a very um, clear equation. And you know, I've alluded to this too that that ultimately, sorry, my uh, ultimately it reduces burden. People are always afraid that when you look under the can you look at him? When you look under the rock, um, when you look under the rock that it's going to put you out of business. And again, it, it, it's the opposite. So you can see this of those 35,000 always the most, most, most prevalent is the least severe that you don't have to do anything about. And those, those high risk answers are incredibly, are, you know, are much rarer. And then finally, my final, my, really my final point is that it's actually a really good thing that we're all beginning to do one thing. Many thought leaders talk about this. The science and the public health demand uniformity. When you don't do one thing, you get imprecision, you get noise, and we cannot afford this. So on the bottom, this is the FDA guidance that says, you know, they ask for the CSSRS and they say, you know, if you do other things, it will cause variability, which is particularly problematic with suicidal issues, and we just cannot, cannot afford that. So this is my email, and I wel we welcome any questions. This is our website. You can go and get trained on the website. We work with systems all the time, um, you know, to, to help systems and states and other things.